little French day and a modern French landscape. Some rhythms of farm life never change. If you could trace the genealogies of these farmers and their animals, you could probably go back for centuries and find their direct ancestors doing the same things in the same buildings. A thousand years ago, agriculture in northern France had hardly touched the native forests. Human settlements consisted mainly of small, rough clearings around run-down hamlets. We now call those times the Dark Ages. The present agricultural plenty arises directly from the minerals in the rocks beneath it calcium-rich limestone rocks that, like all limestone, and for that matter, all of northern Europe, used to be beneath the sea. Looking out from this spot 140 million years ago would have been a lot like being in the Caribbean today. A huge sea was large, warm, and shallow, dotted with tiny islands. To see how this evolved into a continent, we can run the map of Europe backwards and watch the drifting plates in the planet's crust revert to old positions. 20 million, 50 million, 100 million years ago, Europe sinks. and then rises. 250 million years ago, Europe was an empty desert. But then the sea returned. Running the map forward again, we see the great plates moving apart, stretching the continent, and after 70 million years, finally letting the tide pour in. Life came to Europe with the sea, and with life came the processes that would create a new Europe. The chemical mixture that was the sea included dissolved calcium carbonate, lime. The marine animals, mollusks, crustaceans, fish, starfish, drew on the lime to build shells, teeth, bones, spikes. They distilled the lime out of the water and solidified it. The shrimp could turn floating molecules into hard body armor. Lime could also solidify by itself, congealing into grains. And over millions of years, the granules of lime formed layers, each compacted and hardened by the great weight of others until they became solid rock. These limestone floors of the ancient seas became the agricultural bedrock of Europe. Now, in the course of geology's slow, relentless push and stretch, this part of the earth is once again dry land. 
the former sea floor has been lifted. And it's this stone from the seabed that gives the region its fertility. Soil on limestone is neither acid nor alkaline. And in this balance, plants can draw the nutrients they need. Limestone is porous, too, which means that the soil above it is well-drained, fine and friable. Finally, limestone basins are flat or gently curving, and that, with the fine soil, makes the ground easy to plow, hoe, sow and harvest. People have appreciated the richness of this land since their earliest occupation of it. In prehistoric times, they turned it with crude hand plows, and each spring saw their labor rewarded as the new season's crop burst through the soil, bringing food for the year to come. Some of these early farmers celebrated the harvests, and by implication the soil and the limestone, in vast landscape drawings. The limestone itself was sometimes used to proclaim its own fertility. The Cern Abbas giant was etched in limestone during the days of the Roman Empire. The Romans too had harnessed this fertility establishing an efficient and productive agricultural system. But eventually, their empire stretched itself beyond its limits, and like a stretched piece of geology, it collapsed. Though the soil was fertile and the climate kind, the land lay fallow and weeds flourished. The conflict of the Dark Ages had begun. The turmoil of the Dark Ages was about the land. Marauding tribes that didn't have fertile farms of their own would wait until harvest time and then swoop into northern Europe's plains. The tide of destruction came from all directions. Saracens from the south. The Magyars from the east. The Vikings from the north. Not just the farms and farmlands, but the entire social system was destroyed to be replaced by another. A basic split developed in society, with fighters on the one hand and farmers on the other. While the farmers devoted themselves to agriculture, the fighters trained themselves in the arts of war to defend them. By the 10th century, the fully armed mounted knight had evolved and for 800 years, the battlefields of Europe were to ring to the sound of sword on armor. An important difference between the two classes was that the knight was free and the farmer wasn't. The price the farmer paid for his protection was his liberty. As this two-way exchange, the basis of the feudal system, spread across the limestone plains, it made the job of pillage much more problematic for the invaders. The knights went on the offense, too, and destroyed all the Viking battle camps, all but one, centered on Rouen. As the Viking chief Rollo expanded his lands, he adopted the feudal system himself, and it worked for him, too. <laughs> 
The lands Rollo appropriated all those centuries ago were part of the rich limestone basin. He and his knights prospered. The marauders became protectors, colonizers. For the first time since the Romans, the farmers here could feel secure. Once again, harvest became a time of plenty rather than fear. These settlers from Scandinavia integrated with the local people and even converted to Christianity. No longer Vikings, they were simply men from the north, Normen or Normans, and their rich lands were Normandy. As their power and wealth rose, the ambitions of Norman dukes began to fly well beyond their Norman domain. With his iron will, the sixth duke, William, was able to unite the Norman lords. A formidable power had grown up on the fertile plains. The time had come for foreign adventure. William claimed that Edward the Confessor had bequeathed him the English throne, and in 1066, with a fleet of 700 ships and a mounted army of 7,000, he crossed the channel to collect his inheritance. A Norman monk who saw the Battle of Hastings wrote, the shouts of both the Normans and the barbarians were drowned in the clash of arms and by the cries of the dying. The battle raged with the utmost fury, but at last the English began to weary and submitted to their punishment. William was now the conqueror. His conquest of England won him a crown and a country four times the size of Normandy. Feudalism and the Viking culture had combined to produce a powerful hybrid. Other Norman lords scoured Europe in search of new lands. They left their mark from Seville to Strasbourg and created kingdoms in the Holy Land, Italy, and Sicily. And everywhere, they built castles. The knight was the sword arm of the military machine, but the castle was its firm foundation. Within the castle's protective shadow, in France, England, and the other domains, agriculture thrived using the latest technology. Food production soared. In the midst of such plenty, the church made sure of its share. It amounted to a 10% tax on everything and everybody. Special barns were built to hold the produce, known as the tithe, or God share. There were many different types of tithe. There were green tithes levied on fruits and vegetables, blood tithes on livestock, But most important were the major tithes on staple foods which everyone needed, wheat, barley, oats, wine. Sometimes the church used the produce directly, sometimes it sold it. But what it amounted to for the community was that hallmark of civilization, the surplus, the safety net. The gigantic proportions of Norman tithe barns bear witness to the extraordinary productivity of the times. Only grain would have been stored here, and high up in the roof with the pigeons and jackdaws, a lone monk would have watched over the mountain of grain. With its income from tithes and donations, the Christian church became as rich as the temples of the Greeks and Romans had been, and like them, experienced a building boom. Temporal wood was replaced by everlasting stone. By the 11th century, the art of stone masonry began to flourish. <laughs> 
Stonemasons crafted William the Conqueror's own church in Normandy. He was eventually buried here, but after many desecrations, all that remains in the grave is said to be a single shin bone. William's church is a massive edifice, which depends for its stability on thick walls and pillars. The style is known as Norman. But soon, the novelty of stonemasonry in itself wore off, and this style began to look staid, even gloomy. The Christian church was dynamic and rich and wanted architectural adventure. It wanted the stonemasons to build churches full of windows and light. The new Jerusalem, a fitting place for God to live on earth. A big place. A cathedral building mania swept Europe. And limestone, which had already produced much of the church's wealth, provided the raw material. It was a stonemason's dream, easy to work, but immensely strong. It was as though the geological processes had created a building material with the stonemason specifically in mind. When 140 million years ago the stone was laid down, it was truly solid, with no veins or fractures. It always bore its load evenly. Cathedral walls no longer needed to be so massive, so long as they were propped up by limestone buttresses. In order to support the roof without shading the windows, they invented flying buttresses. By way of lace-like arches, the weight of the roof was relayed to the outer walls without intercepting the light. Eventually, the windows became so large that the building seemed to have no solid walls at all. Instead, a forest of masonry guided the huge forces safely down to earth. Inside, the effect was stupendous. Medieval bishops competed for architectural transcendence, trying to build the vaults of their cathedrals ever closer to heaven. In 1163, Notre Dame in Paris held the record at 108 feet. Then Chartres rose to 118 feet, Reims to 124 feet, and finally in 1225, this one, Beauvais, became the highest of all at 157 feet. Limestone came in several varieties, determined mainly by the fineness of the grain. There were interior limestones and weatherproof exterior ones. The very finest grains were best for the most delicate carving. Individual quarries became famous. The limestone for this screen in England's Durham Cathedral was cut from a quarry in Caen, William the Conqueror's hometown. Its grain was among the finest in Europe. To reach this altar, to become this delicate carving, it first had to be carried 700 miles over land and sea. 
The magnificent Norman cathedrals still stand and are still used and can still remind us of the nation of knights that rescued Europe from an age of darkness. And like all noble heroes when their job was done, they vanished. By the end of the 12th century, the Normans were gone, made obsolete by the general peace and wealth that they themselves had created. Even the climate had blessed the new Europe. The 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries were characterized by a succession of long, hot summers, which meant record harvests, full granaries, flowing wine. The warm sun inspired a surge in wine. In the 13th century, more of Europe was covered by vineyards than ever before or since. were ripening as far north as Norway. It was an age of wine. Everyone made it, everyone drank it. Water was reserved for paupers and prisoners. Wine was a food, a tonic, a medicine. Every important French vineyard now in existence was laid out before the 14th century. Wine then was about half as alcoholic as it is today, and it was perishable. Bottles hadn't been invented yet, so the best vintage year was always this year. It had to be drunk as soon as possible, or it soured. The rough red wine was the poor man's drink, while the genteel folk quaffed white. In either color, though, its flavor often needed assistance, and wine was commonly mixed with honey, ginger, cinnamon, cloves. Sometimes nothing short of hot peppers would do the job. And wine then didn't travel, at least not overland, not in wooden barrels on bumpy roads. But at the same time, vineyards near coasts were the source of an enormous overseas trade. The surplus for export amounted to a medieval wine lake, and the resulting commerce brought even more prosperity to these regions. And that helped bring a series of baby booms. Everywhere, the population doubled or tripled, and in some places it went up tenfold. Europe was awash with people. The population growth brought by prosperity had ended in a problem, how to produce enough to feed everyone. Well, at such times, conceptual leaps are needed, inventions. Sometime in the late 12th century, probably in England, a way was found to use the wind to grind grain. That helped, but otherwise, the solution to food shortages was to plow more land. In the Netherlands, the solution was to create more land. There, windmills were eventually used to pump water. Over the centuries, by means of ditches, dams, and dikes, former marshes and even seabed were converted into productive farmland. It was medieval land reclamation that created this characteristic pattern of land strips known to the Dutch as polders. <laughs> 
Like any nationality that pioneers a technology, the Dutch were in great demand for their expertise, and their advice on drainage was sought throughout Europe. There are other traces of this medieval land hunger. How to make a hillside level. Cut narrow terraces, just as wide as a plow. Steepness, no consideration. It must have been a back-breaking job, the kind only much hunger could provoke. In some places, though, even level dry places within the limestone basins, no amount of ingenuity could create farms. The soil was too thin. But where you couldn't grow crops, you could sometimes grow animals. Sheep were not just sheep, they were golden-hooved sheep, a source of milk, cheese, butter, parchment, and above all, wool. Wool meant clothing at home, but mainly it meant export. Export meant trade, and trade meant wealth. By 1275, England was exporting something like 9 million fleeces a year, bringing in almost half a million dollars, equivalent today to about 3 billion. Wool from the British Isles was woven, washed, and dyed by artisans, members of highly organized guilds. The hub of the wool trade was Flanders, it lay at the center of a web of trade routes which linked northern Europe with the Far East and thus the whole of the known world, connections which had not been made since Roman times. The commerce changed northern Europe's society. As merchants got rich, town life revived, and the towns themselves flourished into cities. Besides Flanders, the other two hubs of European commerce were northern Italy and the Champagne area of France. Their trade fairs attracted merchants from all over the known world. And European wool attracted their goods. Honey and hardware, furs and pitch, silver, silk, slaves, spices. In a sense, it was a rebirth of civilization a revival of the Greek and Roman traditions of using farms as support systems for cities. But the flaw was this. As support systems for the growing cities, the farms weren't quite good enough. With their antiquated technology, they couldn't keep up with the population explosion. The 13th century farmer, using the best methods at his disposal, produced five times less food on his acre than a farmer on the same acre today. The farmers just couldn't feed everybody. The great age of medieval limestone riches came to an end as the 13th century itself did. It was only a matter of time before the food ran out, plunging the population of Europe back into a new, dark age. Even the sun seemed to have shut down in the far north. Greenland's Norse communities were cut off by the sea ice. They all died. In 1306, Europe was hit by its first really hard winter in 300 years. Immense storms battered the North Sea coasts, killing thousands and flooding the reclaimed lands. Other climate changes were on their way. It was the beginning of a time now referred to as the Little Ice Age. No one knows what caused it, 
Maybe the Earth had shifted slightly on its axis. More likely, sunspots reduced solar heat. Maybe, and it had happened before, a volcanic eruption had cast a cold shadow over the continent. But whatever happened at the cosmic level, on the human level, it brought havoc. Thirteen fifteen was a year of solid rain. Grain couldn't ripen. The hay was too wet to cut. And in 1316, the rain kept falling. And in 1317... Livestock sickened and died. And people, of course, starved. The population explosion had come to a tragic end, to a reversal. And far worse was to come. The trade routes that had once, in an age of sunshine, brought prosperity, now, in an age of gloom, brought plague. The Black Death swept through Europe with the speed of an invading horde, bubonic plague carried by fleas on rats. In such weakened people, there were probably other causes of death too, but whatever the causes involved, a third of Europe, 20 million people, died. People believed, and it was easy to believe it, that this was the end of the world. Boccaccio, an eyewitness, gives a glimpse of the nightmare. Many died in the public street. There was not enough consecrated ground to provide tombs for the vast multitude of corpses. They dug a trench in which they laid the bodies as they arrived, hundreds at a time, piling them up as merchandise is stowed in the hold of a ship, tier upon tier, each covered with a little earth until the trench would hold no more. By night, the dogs dragged them forth and devoured the bodies. Fathers and mothers abandoned their own children to fate untended as if they had been strangers. After the aforesaid pestilence, many villages and hamlets became desolate, all having died who dwelt there. And it was probable that many such villages would never again be inhabited. The chronicler was right. This is one, Drassy, in mid-France, abandoned forever. Believing that the Black Death was a direct punishment from God, the cult of the flagellants sprang up. Their specific aim was to induce God to relent by punishing themselves with whips. The chroniclers of the day watched, aghast. With scourges, they lashed themselves on their naked bodies so that they became swollen and blue. The blood ran down to the ground and bespattered the walls of the churches in which they scourged themselves. Flagellants may have been fanatics, but in an age when the worldview did not include science, fanaticism in the face of an unknown pestilence could make perfect sense. And then, as if famine and pestilence weren't enough, 
war. In fact, the war between England and France, the Hundred Years' War, had already been in progress for decades. By the middle of the 14th century, the knight had become a mercenary, a freelance soldier and vandal, paying himself with booty. Any purpose to the war seemed to have been forgotten by its main protagonists. The century's best-known knight, Bertrand de Guéclin, gives his view of the noble cause. We have ravished women, burned houses, slain children, and extracted ransom from everyone. We have eaten their cows and sheep and stolen their geese and pigs. We have drunk their wines and violated their churches. No wonder the war lasted a hundred years. The soldiers were making a good living out of rape and pillage. And in the later stages, they ceased to resemble soldiers. They were just a band of thugs roaming Europe and bleeding it white. By the end of this miserable century, the 14th, Famine, plague, war, and thuggery had cut Europe's population in half. Recovery from the horrors of the 14th century would take more than 300 years. And in time, the Little Ice Age came to an end. But in the course of European society, the climate would still make big differences, initiate big events. Paris, for example. In the new recovery, this became a city, a huge one that took over the surrounding countryside. Unlike most big cities, it got along without a seaport. Every day from the surrounding farms, food was carted, driven, and barged into the teeming city. By the middle of the 18th century, as in the 14th, the supply of food was just meeting demand. All it took to upset the balance was a little bad weather. Hailstorms. Just before the harvest of 1788, the French countryside was hammered by a series of hailstorms. Crops were ruined, grain supplies dwindled, prices soared. Famine threatened, and a peasantry that was already restless erupted in riots. In July 1789, exactly a year after the hailstorms, the French Revolution had begun. The revolutionaries fought for the principle that a full stomach was a fundamental right. But the problem wasn't necessarily rights. It was once again too many people living off too little land. Farming technology had still hardly advanced. Starvation and riots looked set to follow each other for centuries, and that might have happened. Except for yet another geological surprise. It surfaced in southern Poland. It was a thick, black, vile liquid, a nuisance that contaminated wells. But the peasants here not only put up with it, in time, they made the best of it. It was a useful, general-purpose lubricant. They used it to preserve wood to waterproof boats, to cure skin disease. According to some stories, they even tried to make vodka out of it. It was, of course, crude oil. And it was a product of the very same seas which 140 million years ago had laid Europe's limestone. Limestone built up in the sea's shallow parts. The oil was made in the depths, in trenches so deep that no light ever reached them and no dissolved air 
When the creatures of the sea's surface died, and at that time those creatures were mainly swarms of plankton, the yellow areas are the limestone, the black are the trenches of oil, oil that is still locked up under Europe today. It doesn't lie there in great underground lagoons. It's imprisoned in porous rock, which holds it like a sponge. These shales off the south coast of England are soaked in oil. It actually seeps out on its own. Oil has always been, to some extent, accessible, but except perhaps for preserving wood or waterproofing boats, it was never truly useful until it was distilled. An enterprising Polish pharmacist, Ignacy Lukashevitz, came up with a solution in the middle of the last century. He devised a method for making kerosene from the crude oil and went on to design a cheap and efficient lamp. When that venture was successful, he set up what is claimed to be the world's first oil extraction business based on his own experiments in oil distillation. Then another entrepreneur, one in New York, heard of the lamps and began to import them. By the middle of the 1870s, there was such a demand for kerosene lighting that a mineral oil industry was born. Though the design was improved many times, Lukashevitz's lamp had become the basis of a world oil trade. In the early days of the industry, 